But one of the things about evaluating a male for sexual dysfunction after a spinal cord injury is just like anybody else, you have to figure out how things were going beforehand. As we know with the aging population in this country and certainly as well as the aging population in the spinal cord population because of how good we are at other medical advances at keeping uh, these guys alive longer, you do have to start looking at things like how are things before? The number of people that I diagnose with prostate cancer, for example, in the spinal cord population, which we wouldn't have thought of a generation ago, uh, or any other disease that's associated with aging has to be taken into consideration. So the easy question is, well, how were the erections beforehand? Because certainly if you had issues before they had the injury, then we do have to look at the entire picture of the man, not just the picture of his injury. So those are the kind of things that I asked. Certainly I want to know if uh, they have an active partner because this is absolutely, regardless of the etiology of, a, of sexual dysfunction, it's a couple's disease for the most part. So definitely want to keep that in mind. Uh, libido issues for the spinal cord injury population in general, because of the multiple health comorbidities, uh, a lot of guys, even without having any alterations in their testosterone, which we'll get to in a little bit, can certainly be a factor. These are all things that, that as healthcare providers, we have to be comfortable asking. And as patients, as, as men that have spinal cord injuries, they also need to have some advocacy themselves to be able to approach the subject. Because if they don't bring it up, and we as healthcare providers don't ask it, then we're never going to really know the answer. We're never going to be able to actually help these guys. So that's important. Uh, in terms of what you get down to the, the differences in, in sexual dysfunction, is as with anything else we deal with, the level of injury is important. Typically, the lower the level of the injury, the closer you are to the sacrum, uh, the worse off their erections are going to be spontaneously. And, and sometimes some of the modalities we'd like to use to treat are also not going to be as effective. So level of injury is important. Uh, what about the logistics of do they have a chronic indwelling catheter, which, believe it or not, does not necessarily preclude them from sexual function, but it can certainly change the dynamic of the relationship. Uh, so again, suprapubic tube versus indwelling versus intermittent catheterization. You know, in, in, in uh, urology, we're very simple because we specialize in men for the most part, and men have one pipe for two goods. So we have to ask a little bit about urinary function because we only have one pipe for two functions. So, so that's all I, I bring up there to understand the difference between uh, the various ways of urinary drainage. So what about the labs? You've done your physical exam. The things that I think are interesting, and I just, I just updated this because I realized since I've been in practice now for about seven years here in town, uh, the number of guys that I am screening uh, that meet criteria for, for screening for prostate cancer in the spinal cord population is going up. And so I say uh, PSA, if appropriate, just meaning that I do want to know their prostate cancer status because that certainly can have an impact on their sexual function. But the stuff that we already know about testosterone, very important. We'll get into that later, as I said. And FSH is the pituitary hormone that controls sperm production because, as we're going to get to later in this talk, we're going to learn about uh, impact of FSH, impact of sperm production in a guy's with spinal cord injury. So those are the blood work, pretty simple. And then again, it goes back to, well, what are the simple medicine stuff? Diabetes high risk for sexual dysfunction, high cholesterol, high risk for sexual dysfunction. So just a thorough laboratory assessment is all we really need to get into. So let's jump right into some of the treatment options because I think once you've done the workup, which is not that difficult or involved, we really want to know what's available to treat our patients. So the top line is uh, going to be on the, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors. These have been around forever. These are the guys that we know of as Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Staxin, there's a brand new one that just came out within the last month called Stendra, which is a lot faster acting, has a little fewer side effect profile, it's more selective for that enzyme. I think this will be an interesting drug in the spinal cord population because uh, as we get down to here, anyone on nitropaste, so certainly you don't want a guy to have a phosphodiesterase inhibitor around the time of autonomic dysreflexia because of the hypotension. In other words, those guys can drop their blood pressures down so low uh, on that combination, that would be a concern. So adenophil, which is the newer drug on the market, has a much shorter half-life, less than eight hours, and about a 15 to 30 minute onset of action. So, so that might be a great one for a guy that really does have difficulties with AD that's going to be in the system fast and it's going to, it's going to wash off fast as well. Uh, so who knows if that's going to be a game changer in this population or not, but, but certainly something that, that is a differentiator on the market. So only problem with this of course, is it's a very expensive form of medicine, and most insurance companies don't cover it. So uh, that's a, a barrier that, uh, that 
is hard to overcome. Beginning to be a long time before any of them are generic as well. So that's just what we have to live with. Uh, daily therapy is an interesting thing in the spinal cord uh, population and was one of the studies that I'd like to try to get off the ground in, in the copious amounts of spare time I have is looking at this. We know in other populations that daily low dose uh, of any of these medicines has an impact on improving the function of the penis itself. The building block of an erection is called the endothelial cell. And we know that if you have a chronic, a chronic or static level of these in, of med medicines or these enzyme inhibitors on board, it can actually improve the level of the endothelial cell. So I have a hypothesis that if we look at a spinal cord injured man in that spinal shock phase where they do have a neuro, what's called a neuropraxy or a shock of those, of the enzyme, I'm sorry, of the uh, nerves that control erections, perhaps there's a role for neuroplasticity and protection on these on a daily basis. So if anybody wants to jump on board and help me write that protocol, I'd uh, take volunteers at the end of the lecture. But, uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully have some, some degree of data on that in the future. So what about the logistics? Uh, there's a lot of good studies on, uh, on sexual dysfunction in terms of actually if you can get the erections, how do guys position? Uh, something that our sexual therapists in the community are very good at working with our, our spinal cord population and helping guys understand there's more than one way to, to have intercourse. And so uh, that's just something I mentioned that as part of the assessment, you have to look at these practical considerations. Uh, there are a lot of different aids out on the internet, which of course everybody is so familiar, probably far more familiar than I am. Uh, I promise that uh, all my accounts are firewalled, so I really can't look on those sites. But I've heard there's some really nice sites out there where you can find information about, uh, about various uh, sexual aids to help with positioning uh, that uh, are unique to this population. So here's something I, I put in this slide actually within the last year or so uh, when I'm dealing with uh, uh, some of my patients because I had a, a guy, and I don't see him here, um, so I won't mention my name either, but he, uh, he really said, I mean, he brought up a very good point that if you have a relationship where the female is the primary caregiver as well as the, the intimate partner, there are some issues that you have to deal with in terms of taking care of the patient uh, the ins and outs of bowel protocols and, uh, and catheter, as well as then turning that around and being uh, a sexual entity. And, you know, I kind of, and I agree with that 100%, but I also kind of argued with him that, that you know, you can go back to, to Sigmund Freud to look at the relations of, of women in our society anyway, and, and a woman has many roles already, regardless of whether her, her husband or spouse has a spinal cord injury, that, that that is a very plastic role. In other words, it's a role that can be uh, changed and, and also uh, very uh, dynamically changed on a moment's notice. So I don't think it's as much of an issue as it's something just to bring in and realize that, uh, that the caregiver obviously has a very, uh, a very 180 degree role as being a sexual partner as well as then uh, being the uh, person that does all of the care for the, the, the spinal cord injured man. Okay, so getting on to some of the other more if not invasive, at least more advanced modalities uh, if the pills don't work. And in general, again, the higher the lesion, the, the better off those pills are going to work. But if for guys that do have lower thoracic lesions and below, uh, there are some other things we can try. They may be more effective. The first is an intraurethral suppository. It's been around forever. It's a little pellet. It's called Muse, M-U-S-E. And uh, it takes about 15, 20 minutes to work. It's basically a prostaglandin. So it, it draws blood flow into the penis. And especially if used with a constriction band, uh, it can provide relatively good erection. So that is, uh, is a good first step. There's really no training involved in it. But the efficacy of that is not quite as, as good as the next level, which is actually an injection of a prostaglandin or a combination therapy. There's something. The, the commercially available prostaglandins are called Caverject and Edex. Very effective, unfortunately also very expensive. Uh, some insurance companies pay for them, some don't. The compounded version of this is actually a combination of three medicines we call Trimix, creative thought and creative uh, branding. That's probably why it's compounded. Works very well. I have a nurse that, uh, that most of my patients here has met. She comes down to every clinic I do here, uh, Chris Hitt, that actually trains our guys how to do the injections makes them very comfortable or the caregiver and uh, and that's a very effective very low side effect profile uh, dosing has to be adjusted downward for most men uh, but it uh, but it works very well 
So that's the, the, the less invasive. The last, probably most invasive, but also one that I think we're starting to consider more and more as we get better literature about the safety of this is the, is the penile implant we've all heard about. Uh, and essentially that is a surgical procedure. It takes about a half an hour or so to do the procedure. I do it as an outpatient. I'm probably, in the last few years, I've done, I would guess, at least 10, if not 15 spinal cord injured patients without any uh, infections, complication rates. So certainly in general, I do 50 plus of these a year. Um, and part of it is just because it's, it's a modality that really you have to exhaust everything else before I'd want to start to, to subject a guy to this procedure. And most of the guys we've been pretty successful with actually using some of the less invasive. But when that doesn't work, then the implant's actually a pretty good thing to consider. It is, a, uh, again, a very short procedure, minimal blood loss, really minimal side effects. Uh, it's covered actually by Medicare, which is important since most of the medications we discussed are not. So this actually may be a cost-effective option for some of our guys. Uh, very high partner satisfaction rate as well. Here's a schematic of it. And essentially, the components of the implant are, there's two chambers basically that fit on either side of the, the, the uh, urethra, so it's two cylinders to really replace the normal corporal tissue of the erection of the corporal bodies, which is a paired structure. There is a reservoir that sits above the bladder, and then there is this pump down in the scrotum, and the scrotal pump is what activates the fluid transfer from the reservoir above the suprapubic area into the implant. So basically any time a guy and his uh, spouse, I hope at least, his spouse wants to have intercourse, it's a, uh, a bulb-activated mechanism. Rigidity is good. Uh, the, the implant is inflated as long as the man and uh, spouse want it to be inflated, and then it's easily deactivated by a button on this mechanism right here. So pretty good training. Obviously, that somebody has to have reasonable enough hand function in order to activate and deactivate but very effective, high range uh, or high durability, 10 to 15 years at least before most men would need replacements. And in fact, a few of the, the spinal cord injured population that I've done in the last few years have been replacements or revisions. And so, uh, and they've had their surgeries decades or in one case, decades ago. So very good, very durable, uh, very natural looking. Here's a little noontime porn for us. So the only reason I put this up is not to uh, have gratitude as pictures of male and anatomy, I do this for a living, uh, but this is what an implant looks like. You really can't tell there's anything in this guy's uh, scrotum or penis, except for when it's inflated. And so uh, it is a natural looking thing. I, I tell my guys it passes the locker room test. No one's gonna look at you funny uh, when, you're, when you're nude. Uh, and it works. So enough, enough of, that, uh, of that pornography. Let's go on to the most exciting stuff. Any questions so far before we go on? Uh, we're gonna get into high, low testosterone and fertility here, but are we doing okay? Question-wise, I haven't discussed it. Anybody? No one's lost their lunch on me yet. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. So, right. So quad mix is. Uh, I've used it for for a long time. Uh, my patients have used it for a long time. Let's just clarify that. I have not used quad mix, but anyhow, the um, the quad mix is essentially just adding either a, a substance called forskolin um, or atropine. And quite, so, it, so it works. The nice thing about it is you can decrease the prostaglandin dosing sometimes, and some guys are very sensitive uh, to the prostaglandin. It can actually be painful. And so that's a good use for it, also for guys that aren't responding as well to the trimix. Uh, so I do use it when necessary. Or I also use bimix. Some guys don't need as much or none of the prostaglandin, and they can get by with, get by with the other two ingredients. So, so absolutely. I mean, it's a... It, there's not a one-size-fits-all for injection therapy. The, the, the goal is to know that, that it's out there, it's very effective, and, and probably underutilized. So that's part of what we're doing here. All right, so let's get on to low testosterone. The reason I bring this up is because it's one of the things we don't probably diagnose enough in the general male population, but also certainly in the spinal cord population. And it's something that has a very high incidence, and it's something that can not only improve the sexual function, which is what the title of this talk is, but also can improve some other parameters. Most important, bone density, uh, improve uh, red blood cell guy, counts in guys that are with chronic anemia. It does upregulate erythropoietin production. And so there are other health benefits to, to using testosterone therapy, so you got to look for it. In the traumatic brain injury population, over 70% of those guys are going to have 
low testosterone, probably from hypothalamic dysfunction, that uh, they're not producing the precursor hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, to tell the pituitary gland, to tell the testicle to make testosterone. So their problem is actually way up here. And the spinal cord injury population is probably a, co a combination of chronic inflammatory condition. Uh, sometimes it's other medications that can bring it down. But the bottom line is it's, it's relatively easy to diagnose. It's a blood test and questions, and it's relatively easy to treat. Uh, and this is what we're going to get to here. So there have been a couple studies that I'll actually go through real fast, uh, essentially showing that you know, for 60 years plus we've known that, that men with spinal cord injury have a much higher incidence of low testosterone. Uh, and we got into the one reason. The other thing I would say that I did blow through is just like in the TBI population, uh, anybody that's on chronic narcotic use will actually completely suppress production of GnRH. So their pituitary hormones are undetectable, LH, FSH is undetectable, and then testosterone levels can be even castrate. So again, anybody on narcotics, even if it's a low dose, even if it's a maintenance dose, can certainly have suppression at that level. So very important, especially in that population, to screen for it. And when you think about it, the guys that, have, that are on chronic narcotics are going to have issues with fatigue, uh, issues staying awake, energy. A lot of them have depression. And these are the exact symptoms of low testosterone as well. So there are some interesting data. It's a little too soon to post this, but interesting data in the chronic pain literature showing that guys that are treated with testosterone are actually able to reduce their narcotic consumption because they're treating some of the symptoms of low testosterone with increasing their narcotic use instead of being the exact opposite of what you would want. So pretty neat stuff, and, and we probably should have some papers on that in the next year or so. Uh, so that's what this study shows. I won't get into it too much. The one thing that I would say is uh, how many people in the acute phase of a spinal cord injury have low testosterone, again, going back to that uh, chronic inflammatory state that eventually recovers, uh, but again, something to screen for, something to look for. One of the difficult things as a healthcare provider is to understand what low testosterone is. So you'd think it's easy enough. Uh, it's a blood test and there's a certain level of normal, but if you really look at the level of normal, some labs in Denver have a low of 248 nanograms per deciliter and a high of 850. Some go from 300 to 1100. And the bottom line is that if you look at the endocrine society guidelines that were updated last in 2010, Anybody that has symptoms of low testosterone and a testosterone less than 300 nanograms per deciliter is, by definition, hypogonadal and would probably benefit from therapy. If you further complicate that, which I love to do because it keeps me busy, if you further complicate that, it actually can be age stratified. And so if you look at the spinal cord injury population, uh, that guys tend to be younger, testosterone on men in their 30s should be in the 500 plus range. And it does decline as we get older. And so, again, take everything with a grain of salt. If a man is coming to you at 30 with profound symptoms of low testosterone and you think you might need therapy, you know, do the blood test and make some interpretations based on their clinical scenario. It's time to play country doctor for a second. Uh, treat the patient, not the lab. All right. In terms of the things that low testosterone can affect, it really is a head-to-toe disease. And it can affect everything from, as we know, hair growth and hair loss as we age. Uh, very important for brain development, very important for brain function, and uh, not only just in terms of making stupid decisions, which men are very good at doing, but also in terms of uh, brain function from a standpoint of um, making the, balancing the checkbook and doing some of the fine motor and cognitive skills. So very important, a lot of guys don't realize they're insidiously losing some of those abilities to do the things they normally did intellectually without any difficulty. Bone density, we talked about already. Uh, in terms of sex organs, certainly uh, as we are developing, testosterone is important for both testicle and penile growth. As we age, uh, not as important. It turns to stop somewhere uh, just after puberty, uh, despite what every other guy would hope for in this room. Uh, muscle mass, very important as well. Increases uh, lean muscle mass development. Again, very important because if you think about the amount of, of muscle loss that can happen to men in with a spinal cord injury uh, below the level of the lesion, 
that is what probably is the precursor for loss of bone density. So if you look at all of the activity of where bone is made and bone is, over, is resorbed, it's all at the muscle insertion site. So, uh, so the concept of sarcopenia or loss of muscle actually precedes osteopenia, which we all know about. So if you can do anything to improve muscle wasting, you're going to improve bone density as well, which is why it's nice that we're giving this in a gym today because obviously whatever we can do pharmacologically is one thing, uh, but any kind of weight-bearing skeletal exercise is going to only augment a guy's response to testosterone. In terms of what else you see, so again, in the spinal cord population, uh, we certainly uh, have our share of obese uh, diabetic men. Uh, HIV population, maybe not as enough. Um, as much hypertensive men, especially young hypertensives, tend to have a higher incidence of low testosterone. So again, these are all things that we see on a daily basis as clinicians we should be thinking about low testosterone. In terms of what it can do, I think we talked about this already, but basically all of the, uh, all of the good arrows uh, go down with uh, low testosterone. You lose energy, you get your, your moods down, your libido's down, work performance, all of that stuff kind of gets thrown out. Uh, and, and the stuff that we want to have high arrows in, bone mineral density, body hair, all of that stuff goes down, muscle mass. So, so again, it's sort of exactly the opposite of what you want. There is a questionnaire for developing whether a guy is hypogonadal or not. Uh, this is the only test, I think, where if you answer three out of ten correct, uh, you win. So it's a very rough, um, to say the least, very rough test. Uh, but it is a good screening tool because what you want to do is you want to get everybody to give you the answer of yes, and then you can determine by blood test who really is truly hypogonadal uh, based on, on the combination of symptom questionnaire as well as the, uh, as well as the uh, blood test. If you answer, number one, do you have a decrease in sex drive, or number seven, are your erections less strong, answer to any one of those, and again, there's a very good chance that that man has low testosterone. So, so again, very easy things to do in a busy clinical practice, I think, the best question you can ask is probably getting directly to the sexual questions, especially loss of morning erections. And, uh, and so that's very important uh, to, to really get the guy in the door and figure out if there's anything you can do for him from a low testosterone standpoint. Okay, so what do you do with testosterone replacement? Why would we start a guy on it? Well, because again, mainly as a urologist, they're coming to me because of issues with libido and erections. It's a way for me to optimize their response to anything I can do from an erectile dysfunction standpoint. So if a guy comes to me, we figure out a good treatment protocol to improve his erections, there's a good chance that testosterone placement is actually going to help synergistically with whatever modality I do for testosterone, I'm sorry, for uh, sexual dysfunction. Uh, lean body muscle mass, we talked about that. It's very important. Bone density is very important. And the psychosocial outlook. Uh, again, if you look at the spinal cord injury population and the psychosocial things that they're dealing with on a daily basis and the stresses of this, if they're hypogonadal, they have to deal with that on top of this. So if there's any way that you can improve their response uh, to everything we're doing from a psychological standpoint, from a therapeutic standpoint, then we've done that, uh, that guy a good bit of good. How do you do it? Uh, real briefly, there's basically three ways. Uh, most of the market is dominated by some kind of gel or transdermal therapy, very easy to do, very easy to apply, different modalities for doing it, but essentially it all comes down to your skin is absorbing the testosterone into the bloodstream. Uh, patches are good. I like patches in the spinal cord population for two reasons. One, because if a man is unable to give himself testosterone, then you don't have to worry about transference from the caregivers and they can just put a patch on and change it daily. The other reason I like it because it is, there is a patch that is actually very inexpensive through a specialty pharmacy for about 60 bucks a month. They can get their uh, testosterone replacement covered through, uh, through a pharmacy in Ohio. And so anybody that does not have insurance where the gels are very expensive, patch becomes a very cost effective option. So that's actually something I've been using more and more and especially in the spinal cord population. Uh, the rest is gonna be, the injectables. Testapel is a relatively new player on the market, but it's a, basically a four-month testosterone depot. It's something that you can, I usually put sort of in the, uh, in the anterior abdomen here or in the sort of the high uh, gluteus region. Nice thing about it, again, is that four months of continuous therapy, you get the same advantage of daily 
uh, delivery of testosterone, so you're not getting the peaks and valleys that you see with other injectables. Again, it's a covered benefit of Medicare, so I have a lot of my guys in my Craig clinic on Testapel, uh, and it works great. It works great for the guys that come in out of town and are coming back for their re-evals. You know, I see them three times a year uh, just to do their testosterone management uh, while they're here for other reasons. So, so again, another thing that, uh, that has really changed in my armamentarium as I come down here. And then injections are the old standby. They've been around since the 1930s. They still work uh, as well as they can. All right, so we got through all of the sexual medicine, all of the hypogonadism, and now we're going to get into fertility. How are we doing? Any questions so far? Still, yeah, Tom. Right, so the, trend, the question was, what, what is the trend for payers on testosterone replacement? It's very good in general. There, any private insurance is going to have something on formulary. Uh, some transdermal will be either a tier two and occasionally a tier three. So minimal out-of-pocket expense. They all have copay cards because the beautiful thing is when you have four competing for that same piece of the pie, they have very aggressive uh, copays so that the out-of-pocket is low. As long as a guy has documented serum proven low testosterone it doesn't seem to be much of an issue tom now on the medicare medicaid actually medicaid does have one of those transdermals is a it's axeron is listed as their formulary preferred so so we can get that covered through the medicaid population medicare no transdermals unless you have a part d supplement and with the part d i think it's androgel but even so there's a pretty significant out of pocket so most of my Medicare guys I'm doing pellets on. Convenient and uh, well covered and minimal to almost, almost no out of pocket. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're gonna go to fertility. Sounds good, great. So this is of course what I love to do. This is where most of my surgical practice is outside of penile implants. Uh, this is where you really get to make an impact on young couples who, I think as I was talking to Avery before and, and, and Jake, there's so many people that get such misinformation about fertility in the spinal cord population. I trained in Houston. We would see guys that came in from all over Texas that would come to us saying they told us there's absolutely nothing we could do, you know, and they were getting set up for adoption, which is great. I mean, I, obviously, I think adoption is a wonderful way to go, too. But you at least need to know that you probably have a very good biologic option to have ch children. So to break it down from the male standpoint, there's really two things that can go wrong in the spinal cord injured population. The first is the vast majority of men with any level of spinal cord injury have lost the ability to ejaculate. Now there's some partials uh, and maybe some rather higher lesions where they can still have an ejaculatory response spontaneously, but it's really the, the exception and not the norm. However, there are a lot of ways that we're able to induce ejaculations uh, in these guys. And so we'll get into that in a second. And then the second thing that actually is interestingly changing, although I still believe this, uh, that the quality of sperm, the longer a guy's in his wheelchair, uh, does decline. Now there have been a very, there was a great study at the University of Miami, gosh, about a year and a half to two years ago now that showed that it really wasn't as bad as we used to think. And they've got pretty good serial semen analyses on guys that uh, don't look that bad year to year to year to year. But when I do vibe stims on these guys and I look at their semen under the microscope, it, it really does seem to me at least that the quality gets worse the longer they are from the time of their injury. And most of the time it's a motility defect. And so what that means is when you're looking at a semen analysis, there's really a couple of things we look at to, to make sure a guy's gonna be, uh, have a fertility a successful fertility. One is how many sperm are they making and ejaculating, and two, what is their motility? That's sort of the basic uh, bottom line, uh, quick and dirty about a semen analysis. Uh, we know that the biggest effect across any population with motility is going to be a heat source. The reason that men have developed scrotums is really just because we like our sperm to be about two degrees colder than the rest of our body. So the hot tub, cold lake phenomenon is all based on our sperm telling us where they want to be. So if you're in a hot tub, they're trying to run away from the body, and that's why the scrotum is much bigger. If you're in a cold lake, they're trying to jump back because they don't want to be too cold either. So, so those little guys really have a lot more control over us than you women might think uh, and in so many different ways. 
If you're in a wheelchair all the time, it stands to reason that you're essentially sitting on your testicles with your thighs up next to your testicles for most of the day. So if for anything else, it's probably not inherently the spinal cord injury, but the fact that you just have lost uh, that natural walking around uh, ability to cool your testicles where they want to be cool. If anybody wants to volunteer for yet another study, I think a cooling study would be a great one to do when you think about it. If you, they had a study in France about 30 years ago now uh, where they actually had a great undergarment which only the French could come up with, which ba was basically a way to keep the testicles essentially perfectly cooled at all times. And they had a relative uh, improvement in sperm motility in guys that had motility defects to begin with. So maybe we can revive that study. But the bottom line is it's probably a problem with heat. So uh, we already talked about that. So in terms of how you get a guy to ejaculate a spinal cord injury, there's really two ways to do it. There's only really one way that I do it in the modern era. And that is penile vibratory stimulation, which is something that, that guys can buy on Amazon, because what can't you buy on Amazon these days? And it is essentially a medical vibrator that will induce an erection, I'm sorry, induce an ejaculation, regardless of their ability to get an erection, by just placing the vibrator at the tip of the penis and, and asking that, that reflex arc that starts at about T11 uh, to get into the seminal vesicles and cause that ejaculation to happen. So, Stands to reason then if that reflex arc is around T11 that guys that have high lesions tend to be able to preserve ejaculatory function with penile vibratory stimulation. That's a great way to do it because you're getting two things out of this. One is you're getting a semen analysis so you're able to tell if they have the sperm quality necessary to, to initiate a pregnancy and two, you're able to actually teach these guys to maybe collect that sperm and even do home intravaginal insemination which has a long, long history of success it's uh, not that successful, but it's about as low-tech as you can get and therefore as inexpensive as you can get. So that's the first thing I'm going to try with my couples is try to see if the vibrator works in the office before they spend the money. And if it does, then they can buy that and do it at home or do it in the gynecologist's office and use that sperm for insemination, which is an order of magnitude cheaper than doing in vitro fertilization. So if the sperm quality is good and I can optimize it however I can, uh, usually through some very good supplements, uh, usually also through, through managing those hormones we talked about earlier, then we can actually have some real, relatively decent success with vibratory stimulation. The second is, uh, and I hate to say this especially on camera, but it's a relatively Stone Age way of getting about uh, ejaculation. That's something called electroejaculation. Uh, I've not done that since I've been in Denver. I did it in fellowship. Every time I did it, it's one of those procedures where I actually feel bad doing it to the patient. There's some things, I mean, I can do anything to a guy's scrotum and it doesn't bother me one bit. But electroejaculation uh, is tough because what you're doing is you're putting a heated electrode in a man's rectum that may not be sensate enough to know when his rectum is going to start burning. And then you're causing an ejaculation. It works even in guys that have lower lesions because you're actually bypassing the reflex arc and getting an afferent stimulation of the, of the, the seminal, seminal vesicles in the prostate, which is where that fluid comes from. Downside to it is, I think I already talked to you about it, I've got to put a probe in a guy's butt and turn the heat up until it gets to about 40 degrees and hope I don't burn his rectum. Now that's not bad enough. The real problem is that the sperm quality that comes out of that tends to be not very good for two reasons. One, because most of the time we are doing this under anesthesia. And two, if you're doing it under anesthesia and you're doing it for the first time, that means that whatever he ejaculates is gonna be pretty old quality sperm. So you've already added the expense of anesthesia. You've already said that the quality of the sperm is not gonna be very good. And there's a very good chance you're gonna to need to do in vitro fertilization with that ejaculation anyway. So in my practice today, working with reproductive endocrinologists in town on the female side, it's a lot more effective, less risky to actually go, if the ejaculation through vibratory stimulation doesn't work, uh, then I'll go right to sperm retrieval, which I do either with a microscope or magnifying glasses. Most of the time you don't need any anesthesia at all. And you can essentially make a very tiny incision over the epididymis, the sperm gland, put a little catheter in and, and aspirate as much sperm as you want directly from the epididymis or the testicle where the quality is gonna be a little bit better and use that immediately for IVF. Uh, on the female side, in vitro fertilization has gotten so good, that's really the other reason I don't do electroejaculation anymore. Because of the morbidity to the patient, the cost savings isn't that much, 
And my female, my colleagues on the female reproductive side have gotten so good at this that it makes more sense to usually go directly to IVF if the PVS or the penile vibratory stimulation doesn't work. So that's sort of how my decision algorithm has changed over the years. All right, so we're going to sum this up. I mean, essentially, there's so much out there to help these guys and so much misinformation that we really need to correct. And we have to ask the right questions as providers, as patients. We have to ask the right questions of our providers. And sometimes, you know, if you look at the, it, it's easy for me. I mean, I do this every day of my life. So I, I, this is all I do. So as a, as a physician, I can talk to my patients about anything. I would give them a hundred bucks if they could make me blush from what I hear from them. But for guys that don't do this every day, uh, it can be tough. And so for, for the patients, approach it, you know, come up with, and usually it comes up as a joke or it comes up as anything else. We're saying, hey, everything else is going good, but, you know, let's start talking about sex. And we have to be absorbent of that and say, okay, well, here, here are some options. This is what we're going to do to give these guys a plan because this is often the last piece of the puzzle to get them to restore normalcy to their lives and restore intimacy to their families and also give the guys the courage give the guys the ability to go out if they are single and start making those connections that, and relationships that they want to make. So that's what I'm here to do. That's what I'm here for. I, I come down at least four times a year for a clinic. My office is right by the home of the future Super Bowl champions within the next five days or so, I'm hoping. So I'm right across the street from, uh, from the stadium. Easy to get to on, on a major bus line, so it's pretty easy transportation. Uh, so use me. That's about it. Any questions? Cute dog slide. I had to, this is my dog Bodie who, when I first did this talk five years ago, had no gray hair. Now he's an old silver dog. He's still a wonderful dog though, so I had to keep him in the talk. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Lyrica is an interesting drug. It, it causes, uh, the sperm deficiency is minimal, but any, and, and I'm not sure, actually, you're going to, Lyrica is, it's along the GABA pathway, is that it? Yeah, so, so the SSRIs, actually, there have been a couple of good reports out that they can, and especially, well, it's only because they're the first two in the market, Zoloft and Prozac, uh, both have shown impairment in sperm motility. Lyrica is a lot, it was, it was it's not a FDA warning, but uh, but I am starting to see a little bit more of that, and I don't think so. But I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know that off the hand. But uh, but again, it's so hard in this population because what you're seeing is not usually a production; it's a motility defect, and that's the snapshot I get. Is here are all the different ways you can have motility defects: heat, uh, varicocele. We didn't talk about uh, still common in the spinal cord population, and uh, all these medications. So. You know, so my goal is to optimize everything I can. Do I ever recommend stopping the SSRIs or Lyric? I, I haven't yet, uh, because most of the time we're able to bypass that somehow. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you can do that. I mean, again, if and that's that's absolutely true, Tom. If the if in the penile vibe stem, which they can do at home. It's, it's much better to do frequent ejaculations if they're able to, absolutely. And, that, and that's also, I think, an, another reason why sperm quality tends to be better with that modality, because if they're able to do that, you can either train them to do it or have them come into the office a few days before their time for an insemination and, uh, and then kind of get the pipes cleaned out and ready to go again. So absolutely. Yeah, you mentioned um, exercise helping with low Yes, all of that weight, weight, you're right. I should say, if not weight bearing, at least weight resistant. How about resistance? I should change that slide. You're right. Just any kind of resistance, because what you're doing, anytime you're challenging the insertion of the muscle on the bone, that's where, that's where the magic happens with bone density. And, and also that's where, you know, the testosterone levels themselves get better with more frequent activity. So, so again, I mean, I, you know, my goal is not to sell testosterone. My goal is to optimize guys. And if they're able to do this through, through any kind of phys increased physical activity, weight loss. Weight loss is a great way, even in the spinal cord population, to improve testosterone for two reasons. One, 
it's a good stimulus uh, for the pituitary gland to send more signals. And two, the, the heavier a guy is, the more estrogen he makes from the peripheral fat cells. So if you can narrow down the number of fat cells he has, then you're actually improving their testosterone as well. So, so absolutely, yeah. You guys were all grossed out by the penis pictures. I'm sure you were just speechless after that one. And it was funny, I, I emailed these slides to, my, to myself last night so I can get them off of our internal firewall. And so then my wife was looking over the slides and she said, are you actually gonna show that? And I realized how probably callous and numb I've become to anything that would be inappropriate in most dinner circles. So I apologize, but I had to prove a point. Yes. Yes. It is, yeah. So the subcutaneous implant for testosterone is, uh, I do it all the time because, because of the insurance coverage of it is, is good. You're bypassing the pharmacy. So there's sort of no middleman there. And, uh, and it's great for the guys because they don't have to worry about transference, which any gel you have to worry about. So if you're a caregiver applying it, they got to put gloves on and put it on, except for the patches. Uh, and it is, it works, it's, a t it's testosterone. Each pellet is 75 milligrams of testosterone. I put in the number of pellets based on their starting testosterone as well as their ideal body weight and come up with a formula for how many to put in. And it lasts absolutely four months. It's not, it's not a, a permanent pellet. It is made out of kind of a waxy matrix. So they do completely dissolve. So there's no residual sheath or anything like that. Uh, but it, it works exactly the same way. It's just a sustained time-released pellet. I don't because I'll just numb them up. And I use epi and everybody because it helps with uh, bruising afterwards. So I'll, I'll put in lidocaine and epinephrine on everybody regardless of, of sensation. Uh, I do a lot of times if a guy's got enough of a belly and a spinal cord uh, patient, I'll put them up here instead of there. So it's just one less thing for them to put pressure on. So that's the only thing that I will do differently in my spinal cord guys. But I inject everybody uh, to just make sure I get as good uh, hemostasis and they don't get as much bruising when I do that. But no, other than that, I don't change it. You guys are easy. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, for coming out. I really appreciate it. <laughs>